Welcome. Today's program is Venus Thromboembolism, Critical Evaluation of Selected Principles. Our faculty today is Joseph Caprini, MD, Physician Emeritus, North Shore University Health System, Evanston, Illinois, and Senior Clinician Educator, Pritzker School of Medicine, Chicago, Illinois. After completing this program, participants will be able to identify venous thromboembolism risk factors, administer and score a DVT risk assessment, discuss when to use prophylaxis and what prophylaxis is appropriate based on risk assessment, and describe venous thrombosis risk factors associated with family history. Dr. Caprini has made the following disclosures. I would like to now welcome Dr. Caprini. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be able to present these data to you, and it's been a lifelong interest of mine to follow the problems associated with venous thromboembolism, especially those related to prophylaxis. And what I'm afraid that we're seeing these days, and one of the things that's very compelling, and if I go overboard with my emotion, part of the reasons for that is that in this modern society, with all this technology, we have become complacent. And we have failed to pay very careful attention to history and the lessons that have been learned by the generations of physicians that went before us. Oftentimes, things are viewed as being ancient or out of date or not relevant. And because of that, some very important things are overlooked. And during this lecture today, I'm going to try to point out some of those things that I think are absolutely vitally important. And if I make a comment that may sound negative against a guideline or American college or something like that, it's not meant to be negative, but it's just that in the modern day flow of things, we some, uh, somehow have lost our perspective a little bit, and I'm here to try to bring some of that perspective back. In the United States, the precise number of people affected by venous thromboembolism is unknown. Although as many as 900,000 people could be affected, uh, one to two per thousand each year in the United States. A variety of estimates about how many people die of PE, ranging 60 to 100,000, and there's also an article by John Haidt that suggests that it's 300,000. But there's a lot of people that die, and then 10 to 30 percent of people will die within one month of diagnosis, and beyond that, 16.7 percent of people in a recent trial who had a pulmonary embolus and survived were dead at three months. Sudden death is the first symptom in about 25% of people, which denies any healthcare providers, especially those excellent emergency room doctors, from doing anything to save the patients. It is not often realized that people who have a deep vein thrombosis, a clot in the leg, one half will have long-term complications known as the post-thrombotic syndrome, so, uh, with swelling, pain, discoloration, and scaling in the limbs. And we're going to show a few examples of that in a minute. One-third of people with a DVT or PE will have a recurrence within 10 years. And 5 to 8 percent of the U.S. populations have one of the several genetic risk factors that we know about. And that increases the risk of thrombosis. Now, we can't afford to test any, everybody. And as a matter of fact, now with the Genome Project, we're eventually going to be able to get many, many more people uh, and identify uh, blood clots. And the fact of the matter is, if somebody's had a, a, a blood clot and their tests that we do now are negative, that doesn't mean that blood clots don't run in the family. And oftentimes they do with multiple, multiple people. And one of the things I want you to remember, normally when somebody presents a lecture, you remember about 3% of that lecture. Well, I want you to put this in the 3%. Don't ever, ever forget to ask every single patient that you encounter whether or not, not only they've had a past history of venous thromboembolism, but is there a family history in a first, second, or third degree relative, or in somebody that you cohabitate with as a, as a friend, as a boyfriend, girlfriend, as a husband and wife, or whatever it is, because people that live together oftentimes have certain habits that may be conducive to this uh, problem. Pulmonary embolism, here is a typical case. Patient presents to the emergency room with a nonproductive cough, mild wheezing, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, and moderate back pain for five days. Um, the, the, on the surface, this is a pneumonia. Uh, you give the patient antibiotics, send the patient up to the floor. Well, what happened is the three days afterwards, 
uh, a patient uh, developed a fatal pulmonary embolus, and the patient didn't receive prophylaxis. Now, you have to understand about the emergency room. The emergency room is characterized by hours of boredom punctuated by moments of terror. A young woman coming in with a heartbeat of 250, you have to stop her heart with a denison to get her back, uh, a multiple auto accident, um, a, 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 a big uh, cardiac arrest from heart disease. So th here's a pneumonia. They treated the pneumonia and moved on. Maybe they had four or five of those things I just described going on at the same time in the emergency room. So this slipped through the cracks. Now, this isn't just a little regional hospital with 10 beds and a limited staff. This comes from my dear friend who's one of the foremost pulmonologists in the world, Victor Tapson, who's now in California, he used to be at Duke. Here we see venous gangrene, and sometimes when people get uh, anticoagulants, and this lady came in with a deep vein thrombosis, she was treated with intravenous heparin at the time, and three days later her leg got much worse, and with the black toes and so forth. And it was thought that maybe she had a condition known as phlegmasia, cerula, or albidolens, where the venous circulation gets so clotted that it blocks arterial inflow to the leg. And after evaluating this case, we don't have any tests. This is a case, I believe, of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with thrombosis, an allergic reaction to the heparin. And oftentimes that uh, uh, results in an exaggerated clotting profile. So here's another pearl to remember. Anybody who's getting heparin, mostly unfractionated heparin, and these patients have an extension of their thrombosis or they have a new thrombosis in an unusual location, Beware of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Another problem that we don't, we don't often uh, uh, think about, and, and by the way, I'd like to di digress here just a second because what I am enumerating at the present time are what I call the many faces of venous thromboembolism. And in some surgical specialties, they only consider clinically relevant or fatal pulmonary emboli during hospitalization as something to really uh, focus their their eyes on. And as you can see, you have to focus your attention to all of these various problems of venous thromboembolism because there's a tremendous amount of morbidity and mortality and, and also permanent disability in these patients if they're not treated properly. And even if they are treated properly, some people still go on to have a bad event. And here we have a scenario, um, and as you know, the blood returning to the heart first goes to the right atrium. And the right atrium and left atrium uh, are sitting aside from one another with a wall between them. But 25% of people have a patent, what's called foramen ovale, an opening f between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So when blood flows to the right ventricle, it could leak through this, th this potential opening. But normally that doesn't happen. But on the other hand, if a big clot goes into the right atrium, dilates it, now that hole gets bigger. And now the clot can break right over into the arterial circulation and it can go to the, uh, through the heart to the brain and cause a stroke. It can go to the arms and cause an arterial occlusion. I've seen it go to the legs. I've seen it go to the mesenteric arteries and produce arterial thrombosis. And unless you have it in the back of your mind, and you have a keen sense of uh, acuity to uh, recognize that this could be a, a, a patent foramen if you have an arterial thrombosis. So in those cases, an echocardiogram would be very important to make sure that that is not the case. The post-thrombotic syndrome. This is a common event caused by both symptomatic and asymptomatic deep vein thrombosis. And we're talking about the legs, mostly, although it does occur in the arm. It's characterized by leg aching, pain, swelling in the early stages, and late manifestations include skin changes, a variety of skin rashes, and sometimes eczema. Brawny edema, which is like a, a, th a thick uh, elephant-like skin, a bronze discoloration, varicose, and spider veins can be seen. And venous ulceration is the end point, along with venous insufficiency induced lymphedema, we'll talk about it in a minute. But I have this wonderful wife of it'll be 53 years, June 12th, and she's helped me all throughout my career. And we're, if we were on a tour or something, and we're on a bus with people, or we're even at the airport, she points out to me, because she's had to listen to this for so long, who has post-thrombotic syndrome? Here's a typical case. This lady had a bilateral total hip replacement 10 years ago. But look at her legs now. She has ulceration on the left leg. 
She has the characteristic hump of, of, of lymphedema on the dorsum of both feet. And now she's depressed and in a wheelchair with this terrible problem. And, 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 and rightfully so. This is a horrible thing. It can be treated. But this is one of the many faces of venous thromboembolism. And this is why you must be vigilant. And I am, uh, I'm sure, overly emotional about this to prevent any possible clot you possibly can, including distal clots. Now, here's a young man. He's 38 years old. He had a major DVT while he was in a cast 10 years earlier. This is his, the ulcer first appeared two years ago and uh, failed to respond to treatment due in part to the poor compliance of the patient once the ulcer appeared. That's something I never, ever like to blame as the patient for the disease. That's not the, you think about this patient. He has this smelly, foul, draining leg, probably thinks he has cancer and he's going to die. No wonder he doesn't want to go out or do anything. Properly treated, this could be healed. And as a matter of fact, there's a follow-up in this case. This was a case from another country. Follow-up because I'm very familiar with this really good uh, doctors there. They, they've, they, uh, they finally referred him to the right doctors and did heal this ulcer. One of the many faces of venous thromboembolism. So now that we've established that, let's talk about the risk factors for venous thrombosis. And we go back, this is uh, Fred Anderson who worked with Dr. Brownell Wheeler who invented impedance pletismography uh, back in the early 70s. And uh, these uh, uh, physicians as well as epidemiologists like Fred Anderson have devoted their life to the study of risk factors for blood clots. And we've known that, and this was a study that was published uh, around the turn of the century, meaning around 2000, those patients were collected. And these were patients um, that went home from the hospital. They got a blood clot, so they had to be readmitted because in those days, intravenous heparin was usually given. And so it's interesting that uh, these are the various, there's two things about this that are important. The first thing is on the left. You can see the percentage of patients with various risk factors. So all the risk factors aren't the same and they're different and they have different weights, as we'll subsequently see. And on the right side, the more of those factors a person had, the more likely it was that they would be readmitted with a clot. So size matters in, size matters in this case, but also the individual risk factors. Now, this is a very interesting statistic because let's just frame this. You go in for hernia surgery. You go in for a knee, lapar knee arthroscopy to repair a meniscus. Oh, these are low-risk procedures. You don't have to worry about it. Well, now, wait a minute. If you're 20 years old, yes, it's a low-risk procedure. But if you're my age, way over here on the right side of the, of the graph, that simple hernia may be a very serious problem because somebody that lives 70 or 80 years not only is age by itself a risk factor, but chances are they'll have multiple other disease processes going on and they're the consequence of age. So we can't have that mentality. And we can't have the mentality to provide venous thrombosis prophylaxis according to the type of operation. That's old school and that is not correct because we know that we can have low risk patients, have high risk operations with the same incidence of blood clots as patients who have low risk operations but have a lot of risk factors. So how do we do this? Well, we have to take a look at those risk factors. And I'd like to begin, and this is why this history is so very critical. The theme of this next little section is, well, Dr. Just because you're doing a minor surgical procedure, meaning a procedure that for your specialty isn't major, for example, an appendectomy, an ovarian cyst removal, a hernia operation, a knee arthroscopy, those are surgically simple operations. But they may be associated with a thrombosis risk that's significant and serious and a major thrombotic risk. Now, ex could you explain all of that? Well, it goes back again to 1853 when a famous pathologist by the name of Rudolf Virchow identified through experiments and observations clinically that the three factors that led to a venous thrombosis are slowing of the blood flow, stasis, vessel wall injury, and hypercoagulability, uh, which is a, a, a tendency of the blood in the veins to clot too much. And you can see when all three come together, the likelihood of thrombosis is high. Now let's talk about that. When you get an anesthetic, 
if you get a, a general anesthetic naturally, and you know from, from actually inhaling something down, down into your uh, uh, trachea that uh, it's a very sensitive. So they have to put a, tra a tube into you to intubate you. Uh, and to do that, they paralyze your muscles. And when you paralyze the muscles, the, there's a certain muscle tone in the, in the calves, especially. And when that tone is gone, those veins can expand. And the longer they stay expanded, the more likely they will get over distended because they have thin walls and develop cracks. You know, this is not rocket science. In addition to that, the patient's position sometimes is such uh, in stirrups or their heads are up or their straps around their legs. And this all cuts down on the, the normal flow anyway. So that's where you have your venous stasis. And then as a result of that, the veins get bigger and the walls crack. And then you, uh, then you have endothelial damage. Now, hypercoagulability. Well, something very simple here. Those tissues don't die just because they're paralyzed. They continue to metabolize. And those metabolic waste products are now sitting in this puddle of static blood in contact with these cracked vessels. No wonder everybody doesn't get an, a, 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 a clot during surgery. And as a matter of fact, half of the clots are thought to occur in the operating room table. This, these studies go back to the 70s. And one of the reasons for that is these phenomenon. And that's why the, the use of intermittent pneumatic compression, uh, compression pumps to squeeze the legs during surgery are absolutely mandatory to reduce these effects. And something I've seen recently where some people have said, well, if you just put the compression on the non-operated leg, it'll be good enough. It does nothing for the operated leg. If you're doing that, you have to put something on the foot to cause uh, compression. But uh, putting it on the opposite leg has no effect on the operated leg. Now, here is an experiment which is a million power micrograph of a capillary. Now, the capillary, of course, is the junction between the artery, the blood's coming in the arteries, the arteries get smaller, 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 until they become microscopic capillaries. And that's where the secret of life is, where the exchange of oxygen and nutrients into the tissues and the absorption of waste products into the capillaries occur. And now when they're over distended and there's cracks, that's a very bad thing. And as a result of those cracks, two things happen. The first thing is, that because of this hypercoagulable condition where the blood is sitting there and the metabolic waste products are, are actually toxic, in a sense they're supposed to be carried away to, the, to, uh, to be cleared by the liver and kidneys, that you can have a clot start. And don't forget, some people are hypercoagulable going to the operation because they have infection, they have injury, they have cancer. Um, so that all of those effects are exaggerated, but here's what happens with the cracks. Now the next thing, this is a video that shows a white cell turning into an adhesion molecule because the flow has slowed and you saw the picture got dark. And when the flow slows down in the veins, what happens is over and above the distension problem is these adhesion molecules tend to land on the capillary surface. They extrude cytokines which are inflammatory markers, because there is an association between inflammation and thrombosis, create a hole in the capillary. Others come along and join in the reaction. And as you can see, this capillary is now permanently damaged. And ladies and gentlemen, those are the effects of an anesthetic, general or regional, that if it lasts, and that's why if it lasts over an hour, then there's a certain risk of thrombosis. But in order to emphasize that point, enter Dr. Maxwell Borough. Genius occurs everywhere. Now, he practiced at the Somerville, New Jersey Community Hospital uh, and the Somerset Medical Center, which later it was called, and he became chief of surgery there. He was rabid about blood clots. So he studied 1,000 patients in 1981 and 19, in the late 70s and into the early 80s where he, he followed them very carefully after surgery. He did invasive tests to make sure that if there was a clot diagnosed, it wasn't just clinical, but he was looking at all clots with fibrinogen scanning and bilateral venographic confirmation of positive scans. And you can see surgery lasting one to two hours. He found a 20% incidence of DVT, 46% incidence two to three hours, and 62.5% over uh, three hours. Now, forget the fact that we don't see those kinds of numbers today. It was different then. There was no prophylaxis. The surgical procedures were more primitive. And don't forget, these are venographic results. Not every one of those people had clinical symptoms. And the same thing, look at the age. 
Age over 40, 20 percent. Age over 60, 40 percent. Age over 71, 60 percent. Now, stop. Let's just take a breath, including me. Make sure, make sure that you open up that 3 percent portion of your brain that you're going to remember six months from now. And I have one more fact for you to put in it. 66% of the patients in this 1,000 patient study who had a history of venous thromboembolism previously in their life got another clot when they had an operation if they did not get prophylaxis. And prophylaxis was not common in those days. It was thought, some people thought it was ridiculous to give a, 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 a drug that causes bleeding to a patient after surgery. I mean, what are you talking about? And we'll see that that, that, that was the lifesaver. Now, getting back to modern technology and uh, getting back to complacency, oftentimes today we have CAT scanners, we have MRIs, we have troponins, we have D-dimers, we have factor VIII levels, we have BNP levels. What about a history and physical? And in our day, that's all we had was a history and physical, so I've never been able to get beyond that. And, and I have a message for all of you. We're going to divide you into two sides of the room. On the left side of the room, you're going to go have a major operation, and you come in and the doctor asks you four or five relevant questions about your history, which are the most common and pertinent items. Okay, but on the other side of the room, there's another surgeon who wants to take a look at everything possible in your past history, family history, or in your physical examination that might influence the outcome of the operative procedure. Your choice. Which surgeon are you going to go to? Furthermore, if that uh, patient has, those, has a bunch of those risk factors, there's something here that's, that we all can do. And again, open up the 3%. Maybe after a while it's going to be more than 3%, but try to put this one in there with the others. The most preventable cause of death after an operative procedure of any kind is a fatal blood clot. There's a lot of things after surgery. I can remember during my surgery career, the next morning I come into the hospital and I was really nervous because I operated on these people the day before. I was coming around to see them. The operations went fine, but how were the patients? You know the old story. The operation went well, but the patient died. So you really have to be careful um, about that. And, and so the thing is that uh, it's very, very important that you do that one thing that you can control in every patient you see, and that is you can prevent them from having a fatal blood clot. And we're going to see how to do that. Okay, so a number of years ago, um, thanks to some very bright nurses, a PhD, some foreign medical graduates that turned out to be brilliant doctors and worked with me um, and myself, we put together this risk scoring, and it was a community project. To say that this is all because of my brilliance is nonsense. First of all, I'm a B student, and if my, my wife were here, she would actually remind you I had a few Cs too. But what it was is, I'm a partner. I like to partner with people. And partnering with all these people, we got together and we assigned a point value to every risk factor according to the relative risk in the literature at the time of that risk factor causing a venous thrombosis. Then we added the points. For example, age over 75 would be three points, and uh, an operation lasting over an hour, or anesthetic over an hour, would be two more points. So that would be five. So that's how we put the score together. So age and, and operation weren't equatable. A family history of thrombosis or personal history of thrombosis was three. Um, surgery for benign disease is two. It was four if it was for cancer. So that's how it worked. And for many years, I was accused of just talking a good game, but where was the data? Show me the money. Well, fortunately for me, the University of Michigan, well, first of all, a number of countries picked up on this right away because this was the way that they could screen out people and people that had a number of factors, they could provide them with, with this very expensive prophylaxis. And if they didn't, they didn't need to give them that and they weren't going to be at jeopardy of dying. So that became very popular. But the University of Michigan, uh, Tom Wakefield, Vanita Ball, um, Peter Henke, Andrea Obi. Uh, and some others, uh, Skip Campbell. All those people put together a prospective trial trying out this score. And this was the original score. And there are risk factors that are, are worth a point, risk factors worth two points, 
risk factors were three points. For some reason, we never had a four-point risk factor, and risk factors for five points. Now, that's too small for you, but what I'd like you to do is, uh, whether you have an Android or an iPhone, is that we have a free app which has these. Uh, you can do the risk score actually on the app. You could also go to venusdisease.com and uh, my website, and you could do the, the risk factor score there. And later I'm going to introduce you to what my brilliant young people came up with uh, to facilitate collection of the score. And here you see it. We, we have been told, in fact, a recent orthopedic surgeon told me, you know, Dr. Caprini, I'd love to do a complete history and physical and ask the patient 30 or 35 questions. Today's world, we just don't have time. We've got to crank out the RVTs. We have to see the patients. We have pressures on all sides. and Reimbursement is down and all these problems. And my students, first, I had the idea, but my students are the one that made it real. I said, huh, what happens when you go to the dentist's office? you got to fill out your health history. Why wouldn't you have a person when they come in and they're going to have surgery in two weeks or whenever, fill, take, the, take, a, their, take their history and take it home and share it with their family. How many times I've been to the doctor and I'll come home and my, my wonderful wife will say, well, did you ask him this? No. Did you ask him that? No. Did you talk to the doctor? So the team sport where the loved ones get involved in answering the questions is very important, especially for family history. But these young people did something even more important. They interviewed a bunch of DVT uh, patients who'd had a DVT in the past, and they asked them to do the standard score that I showed you in the previous slide. And then they sat down in a think tank, and they said, which of these questions didn't you understand? Because half of it is in Dr. E's. And so from that, they created a patient-friendly form in patient language in order to make it understandable. And then they tested it on a new group of people who filled out the form, and again, they came back and told them what they didn't like and didn't understand. Then they refined it again and sent it out to a third group. And that third group did their risk assessment. And then they were independently assessed by a physician or a skilled provider. And as a result of that, the results were combined. And as you can see, there was almost a perfect agreement between the physician done and the patient done uh, 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 risk. There were a few problems. Now, these problems would take about five minutes when you come in for surgery. Oh, by the way, let's stop. Anybody ever had an operation? What happens when you go in the day of surgery? Are you going to survive? Especially if you're a doctor. Is this guy going to have a good day or not? Number two is, how much pain am I going to be in? Number three, how much work am I going to lose? Number four, you know, I've got children. I've got to take care of them and all that. And then how about this? Are they going to find cancer? Is that any time to be doing a risk assessment? It's ridiculous. So that's why a lot of times those risk assessments done at that time are totally, you think I'm going to think about my family history? I want to know if I'm going to have cancer or not. Anyway, and I had that happen to me, and it turns out I had a spot on my lung. It turned out to be a piece of cartilage. But before surgery, I didn't, oh my God, what am I going to be in for? Anyway, so the four problems are they didn't really calculate the BMI very well, so that can be calculated quickly when they're seen. And uh, you can take a look at their legs, see if they have pitting edema, uh, indentation, and varicose veins, the same thing, not just spider veins. But a history of obstetrical complications. Obstetrical complications may signal an anticardiolipin or beta-2 glycoprotein abnormality. And now I remember I was in morbidity and mortality conference, and uh, this patient, uh, after a big operation, got a clot. And I said, what was her obstetrical history? And the chief snapped back at me and said, Joe... This lady's not having any babies. We're doing our operation to cure her cancer. And I said, yeah, but what you don't understand is that that lady may be carrying a, a factor, an acquired thrombophilic factor called anticardiolipin antibody or beta-2, one of three beta-2 abnormalities. And the only reason we know she's a carrier, we can't test everybody. The only reason we know she's a carrier is because when she had a pregnancy, she had toxemia, she had placental insufficiency, she had unplanned abortions, or she had a stillborn. And those are the clinical events that are very important to capture historically because they'll tip you off to who might be at very high risk for getting a blood clot afterwards. And that justify, even though you're doing a big operation and where there may be bleeding, to also give the proper anticoagulation. So, and another thing is family history. And I've seen, I've got a list of 15 deaths in the last year and a half that I've been asked to look at, all in young people. The youngest person was, 50, the, was 27, the oldest person was 52, 
They all had surgery, so-called not major surgery. They all went home. They all died of fatal pulmonary emboli. And the common denominator was a family history that was either never asked or it was overlooked because it was in a cousin or they didn't think it was important. The other thing is that the score, we, we, I've also been taught. So, oh, by the way, that's in five languages now, that form. And we're hoping to introduce that. You know, I have a form through the Illinois State Medical Society, and we're hoping to introduce the new patient-friendly form at some point in the future after we get all of the, the kinks worked out and after all the approvals and so forth. But it's in English, and, and, and we've also published it in, in Polish, in Chinese, in Arabic, and in Spanish. So, it, and these were all, it, it worked. And, you know, it just, it, it continues to work because there's nothing so revealing as a careful history and physical. The other thing is people come in and they, they initially, they, oh yeah, so you do the initial form, but what happens after surgery if they have a, a leak and an anastomosis and they have an infection that has to be drained, they need a reoperation, then they get a central line for anticoagulants, or we didn't know they had cancer, but after surgery we found out they had cancer. So this is a dynamic document and it has to be refined up to and including an after discharge because the risks can escalate as you go through this. Chart reviews. Chart reviews depend on the accuracy and the tenacity of the data collector, including the amount of time they have and the amount of records they have to review. We're all the question asked. And without sounding uh, disparaging in any form, there's a National Surgical Quality Improvement Project that's a most wonderful project. There's over five million people in the database now, and a hospital can sign up for it, and they hire a dedicated nurse or reviewer, and uh, he or she will take a look at, at uh, 23 complications for the first 30 days in a select group of surgical patients, at least 1,500 of them, and report the results through the database. Remember what we said was the most common preventable cause of death after an operation? Venous thromboembolism. I'm not making this up, by the way. You'll see some more numbers. And a history of venous thromboembolism, a family history of venous thromboembolism, the use, the type, and duration of thrombosis prophylaxis is not in the database. So be very, when you people are looking at these beautiful large studies, a million patients with bariatric surgery, uh, 800,000 hips. Look at it with a little bit of a jaundiced eye because all of these facts, as they say, the devil's in the details and those details aren't there. Christopher Panucci is one of the most brilliant young investigators I've ever encountered and he is also a rabid, rabid risk assessment guru. And here's his latest study, which is now we presented, but now it has just recently been published where he did a chart review with the University of Michigan uh, looking for questions, and I'm just showing you two, the obstetrical history and the family history of thrombosis. And you can see that on the chart review, the incidence was very low, but then when the patients were interviewed face-to-face, -face, look at how it jumped, six-tenths of a percent to 13 percent, highly statistically significant. So we have to look at chart reviews with a jaundiced eye unless it's a prospective analysis where we know all the questions are asked and answered and that the patient had a face-to-face -face encounter. These are just four representative populations, and as you can see, this is another important point. And there's now 100 studies using this score around the world, over 25 languages, and these are peer-reviewed publications. And the results are basically the same. There's four or five negative articles, and we've written editorials to two of them because we've tried to, to, uh, to, and part of it's our fault. This is a complicated job to do this right. And in a few of those articles that didn't show the Caprini score worked, it was because it wasn't, uh, they weren't done right. And in one in particular, in an orthopedic population, they only had complete data on 9% of the patients, yet it got published. But now we have a new study coming out from, from New York that's going to show how that really works. But here's the point there is an exponential increase in the incidence of venous thromboembolism with increasing scores. And what's fascinating is, take a look down here at this left lower one on head and neck surgery. Most of the time in head and neck surgery, there's a very low incidence of thrombosis. 
until you hit a score of nine. And then the incidence jumps to 18%. And the same thing in plastic surgery, it's 60 days. People that had elective plastic surgical procedures and had a score of over eight, 11% of them had an actual clinical clot. So this is really important. And this seems to hold true for every population done. Now the success story for the United States, in my mind, and I'd like to single that out, is Pamela Rosencrantz, Michael Cassidy, and their associates at Boston University Hospital. And they produced a, uh, they've now produced eight papers, but the first one was the, was the one about using mobilization and a mandatory risk stratified prophylaxis protocol. Let's stop again. To all of you out there that are interested in trying out the Caprini score to help your patients, if you don't tie it to mandatory prophylactic protocols, that of course the surgeon could always opt out if there's a reason, but otherwise they have to comply with the protocol, forget about the risk assessment because it's not going to work. People aren't going to do it. It has to be tied mandatorily to a, 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 a prophylaxis plan. So here we go. These are, they divided people into low, uh, lowest low, moderate, high, and highest risk group. So the first three groups, uh, there was 100% compliance with the doctors, and they could do whatever they want during the hospitalization. And as you'll see subsequently, giving them a dose of heparin or even giving them anticoagulants during the hospitalization. Uh, the only reason that they have listed on the slide, this was in the era when the mandatory skip program was in place, surgical care improvement project, or as a JACO mandate, they had to give at least one shot after surgery. Uh, but w we don't recommend that anymore because it doesn't work and you'll see why. Those people that are truly at risk, which means their score was five to eight, they got prophylaxis now. Get ready for this. This is a really, really complicated statement. They get prophylaxis for the period of time shown in clinical trials to be associated with an efficacy, a good result. Seven to 10 days. You can't give one or two doses of an anticoagulant. Would you give one or two doses for a staph, a MRSA staph? Would you do that for a kidney empyema with sepsis throughout the body? Would you do it for uh, a, a meningeal meningococcemia? Of course you wouldn't. You would look at the clinical trials. What do they dictate for those trials? What's the length of prophylaxis? What's the dose? So these people got a week of prophylaxis. That meant in many cases they went home and had to give themselves heparin shots. But if their score was, over nine, was nine or above, they had to do it for 30 days. 89% compiled with seven days, 30, 30 days, 77%. So three out of four. And you're going to say, oh yeah, Dr. Free, I'm sure this was some real uh, Boston Hospital in the rich neighborhood, right? No, no, no. This was an indigent hospital, 503 beds. And the administrators worked, God bless the administrators, they worked a deal out with the drug companies to provide every single patient with the length of prophylaxis they needed, regardless of their ability to pay for it. Now, as you can see, this is not a very popular program. And for those of you on Medicare, you know there's a donut hole. So, this is a really hard thing to implement, but look what happens when you implement it. The incidence of venous thromboembolism at 30 days on the surgical services nearly went away, down to a tenth to two tenths of a percent. Now, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, say this uh, uh, as, a, as a treatment recommendation, but now there are other drugs that you don't have to have injections for. And as we get the trials coming in, they're in for orthopedics. Now you can give one of the new anticoagulants to protect an orthopedics. And we're hoping one of these days we'll be able to use it here because that way we'll be able to uh, catch these people when they go home from the hospital. So mandatory compliance. Without it, forget it. And then Christopher Panucci just recently published an article. Out of all the Caprini articles, he took the 13 purest where the best data was. So remember, this is not, this is academic guidelines. This isn't clinical practice. And these were the purest studies. And if you don't give prophylaxis, again, an algorithmic increase, an exponential increase in venous thromboembolism with increasing score in those people not receiving prophylaxis, 10.7% in these over 1,000 patients, it's actually uh, 20, uh, uh, this particular subgroup is 400 patients, but the overall study was over 2,000. And uh, uh, these were people that did not get prophylaxis. So if you have a patient who's at risk with a score of at least five to six, 
and certainly by 7, they really need prophylaxis. And they need it for the period of time that's been shown in clinical trials to be efficacious. The next point about this score, which is absolutely one of the most critical, is that in this population, 75% of the people didn't need anticoagulants. So there was no risk of bleeding. And they could use physical methods, stocking, pneumatic compression, and they, uh, they, they would be uh, protected. So that part of the score is who, whom do you give it and whom don't you give it? And then for how long? Now, I want to remind everybody, I, I, I've run into this in my over 40 years of practice. I'll come into a situation, and maybe I'll be asked for a second opinion, and I'll give the opinion, and the primary doctor will come back and say, well, Dr. Caprini, there's no good evidence for that. The clinical trials, there's nothing in chest consensus guidelines that justifies you doing that. And I would then have to say, well, and I had this printed out. I'd like to read to you chest guidelines, 1.4.5. Application of evidence to individual patients. Since most thromboprophylaxis studies excluded patients who were at particularly high risk for either VTE or adverse outcomes, their results may not apply to those with previous VTE or with an increased risk of bleeding. In these circumstances, clinical judgment may appropriately warrant the use of a thromboprophylaxis option that differs from the recommended approach. That's especially true for past history or family history of thrombosis. I showed you the data on that starting in 1981. Forget it and you'll have to relearn it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, as a, a practical example of what I'm saying is that if you go to the orthopedic section and chest, chest says, we recommend against routine prophylaxis after lower extremity fractures, tibial fractures, fibular fractures. And then it says in the fine print, which I've, now that I'm retired, I'm able to spend more time reading the fine print. The trials used to produce this guideline, are you ready for this? Excluded high-risk patients. Well, who's going to give low-risk patients prophylaxis after they have a fracture and watch them bleed? You must make sure that if you're going to give them something that's going to cause them to bleed, that you have good cause. So you have to have people with high, that have high risk factors. So you're a witness, Your Honor. No further questions. We also have to take a look. Now, be very cognizant of the fact that these are 33 clinical trials in 33,000 patients that show the, the bleeding complications from giving low-dose heparin or unfractionated heparin. See how many deaths there were? People don't die from prophylaxis. They may have a bleeding complication, they may even have a bad joint as a result of that. They can still play checkers with their grandkids. Postoperative death and bleeding is very rare. Withholding anticoagulant in surgical patients is associated with an increased incidence of fatal TE. Show me the data, you say. Well, let's go back to 1975. VK, VK, uh, uh, VJ Kekar, uh, the youngest surgeon to ever present the uh, academic address at the annual Royal, Royal College of Surgeons meeting in London, God rest his soul, he just died this last year, set the stage with a clinical trial of 4,121 patients in 28 medical centers in the UK and Europe, where people were randomized to be usual care or get seven to 10 days of hep unfractionated heparin. The deaths in the control group were 16. There were two deaths in the treated group. Ulrich Gruber from Switzerland, who was a famous investigator, challenged these results and said that KCAR had fudged some results and there was some controversy about that, just like some of the controversies we have today. Along comes Rory Collins, an Oxford scholar. And in 1988, in the New England Journal of Medicine, he publishes the results of 70 additional trials that had the same design as the KCAR trial. And he showed exactly the same results. Another 13,000 patients. And he showed that the incidence of fatal pulmonary emboli, all pulmonary emboli were reduced, but there was a 66% risk reduction in fatal pulmonary emboli using heparin compared to controls. How about the bleeding? There was no difference in bleeding. 13,000 patients. And these were fatal bleeds. Yes, people bled. Some people will bleed after they get an anticoagulant. Various, th various things. Nobody dies. And so now we have 20,000 patients. 
so far. 98 clinical trials, 15 year period that show this. So apples don't fall from far from the tree. And AJK Carr, VJ's son, who's another brilliant uh, vascular surgeon, as a matter of fact, he's Lord K. Carr. He's the Lord in the House of Commons of England, in addition to being a brilliant surgeon and researcher. He and Sylvia Haas from, uh, from Munich, published, was a famous hematologist, published this study. 23,000 surgical patients, 79% of them had non-orthopedic surgery, 21% had non-joint but orthopedic surgery. And this was sponsored by a drug company. We going to say our low, and this is not a low molecular weight heparin we use in this country. But nevertheless, they say, well, we think low molecular weight heparin will prevent more deaths than unfractionated heparin. So that was the, the low molecular weight heparin versus unfractionated heparin. 23,000 patients, no difference. What was the endpoint? Autopsy adjudicated fatal pulmonary emboli, a tenth of a percent in each group. So if you're at risk, oh, excuse me. What was the period of prophylaxis? Five to 20 days. Was it really one or two days or just during the hospitalization? No. So that if you're at high risk, and I told all my high risk patients when I uh, get them ready for surgery, I'm gonna give you some blood thinners after surgery and you might bleed from them, but you're not gonna die of a blood clot. Now, there were no deaths from anticoagulant bleeding in this study either. Yes, there was, if you read the fine print at the bottom, there were 0.1.3 tenths of 1% and 1.1 tenths of 1.8, 0.18%. Yeah, there were some people bled. Nobody died. Remember, the most preventable cause of death after surgery is venous thromboembolism. And now I have shown you... Um, 160 trials, over 160 trials, in 43,000 patients over 30 years that show, A, that small doses of heparin, low molecular weight heparin, prevent death, and number two is the treatment period is at least five to seven to 10 days. Now, Chess did a meta-analysis of 51 more modern trials in 48,000 general and abdominal surgery patients. And the follow-up was either seven days or one month. So they all got seven days of prophylaxis. And the authors did not emphasize the fact that providing prophylaxis for one week, despite the fact that this period was shown to be efficacious in the 51 trials used to provide the above conclusion, they still only recommended and that's where this got started. The more modern chest guidelines say you can stop anticoagulation from when they go home from the hospital. You show me that data. But I'm going to show you some contrary data. So here we have from 1975 to 2005, 43,000 patients, 160 centers with objective diagnostic endpoints, including in some of the, one of those big studies, fatal pulmonary emboli autopsy adjudicated, anticoagulant prophylaxis for one week established the efficacy. There's none of those trials where short courses of an anticoagulant uh, show anything but seriously compromise the results. So let's take a look at this. Around 2006, uh, the Surgical Care Improvement Project, SKIP, one of the initiatives was everybody had to get a shot of of an anticoagulant within 24 hours of surgery unless they were at high risk for bleeding. And a study done in the VA uh, looked at 30,000 of those patients from 2006 to 2009. 89% followed the protocol and 11% didn't. Did not change the VTE rate. John Haidt, who's one of the most famous epidemiologists in history, fantastic researcher, and he studied the Olmsted County catchment area of the Mayo Clinic for the last 40 years. And he just published a study looking at a half a million VTE events annually. Half of them were due to hospitalization. The event rates haven't changed. Despite the use of near universal in-hospital prophylaxis, and he attributed that to the short duration of prophylaxis. So without quoting the old results, he acknowledged that that was the reason. And a short course of anticoagulants is ineffective in lowering the VTE rate. And number two, identify high-risk patients that would benefit from extended prophylaxis. We've done that with a Caprini score in over 25 languages in over 100 publications. Not done yet. This is in a Surgical Care Improvement Project, 
Has the mission succeeded in orthopedics? And the answer is no. The rate of PE increased during the period of study uh, when this was followed. And now, if that's not enough, here's another 779,000 patients followed for 30 days over five years. The skip adherence improved by 14% and 20% respectively during the five years. Look what happened. The postoperative DBT rate increased. Postoperative VPE rate increased. So short-term anticoagulation prophylaxis postoperatively does not lower the VTE rate. Lowering the VTE rate after surgery requires at least one week, as shown in more than 140 studies over the last 40 years. And one of my co-investigators uh, 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 and, and uh, members of the Illinois State Medical Society, as we were looking at this, very innocently asked me, well, Dr. Cavrini, why did the rate go up? You would think that those shots would have helped just a little. And that was a really brilliant question. That nobody ever asked me that before. And my answer is, I think this is true, true, unrelated. The reason the DVT rate has gone up is because we're operating on older patients. We're doing more complex operations. Um, and, they, and so by necessity, they have more comorbidities. And, and I think that's the reason. And if you don't, and, and then you know how those, the, 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 uh, the DVT rate increases exponentially with increased risk factors. I think a lot of these more modern patients were shoved into the very highest risk category, which means they really should have gotten 30 days of prophylaxis. Giving them one or two days didn't do anything. And we know that 77% of people after they leave the hospital get a blood clot. My brilliant fellow, Juan Arcelis, who's now the chief of surgery in Granada, who was very important in making this Caprini score uh, really materialize. I, was, I had it, but... He, he really made it, helped make it materialize. He and Sandy Candosia, who's now an internist, studied 2,000 medical and surgical patients in 1989 and 90 and showed how important it was. And now in 2008, Juan taking a look at this famous Riete database, which is a worldwide database of registry data about people who actually get blood clots and how they're treated. 77% of people get their clot after they leave the hospital, and 55% of them get after prophylaxis was discontinued. Compelling data. It's a decade old. Why are we just focusing on the hospitalization? This data is a decade old. 138 centers. There's now 70,000 patients in the Riete registry. And here's the data from the, from the National Surgical Quality Improvement Project despite the fact that we don't have any of the criteria we would like to have for DVT, it showed, look at the incidence of pulmonary embolism in 2 million patients for the first 30 days. How many patients are in the hospital for 30 days? Some people never even get into the hospital. And so this, it, the, the evidence for providing prophylaxis for the period of time the person's at risk is overwhelming. Chest in 2004 considered a history of thromboembolism in the highest risk group along with cancer indicated that the risk of thrombosis, based on the historical venographic studies, could be as high as 40 to 80 percent. In 2008, they also said selected high-risk patients, including some of those who have gone major cancer surgery or have had previously had VTE, we suggest 28 days of prophylaxis. Well, in 2012, there are three more big studies, including the Botaro meta-analysis, where all, all it had benign and malignant patients in it, where it really emphasized the data that was previously shown by CHESS to be true, and that is that 28 days of prophylaxis was better than seven days of prophylaxis, and, but they left out the history of DVT. And I still haven't figured that out, despite the fact that the incidence of DVT and proximal DVT was reduced 75% with 28 days of prophylaxis. And remember Dr. Boro? Anybody remember Dr. Boro? 1981, 66% of people who had a history of thrombosis got another clot without prophylaxis. Is 28 days of prophylaxis better than seven days? That's what Jets told us for a decade. Your, evidence, your, your witness, Your Honor, I can't add anything more to that. Now, you have a patient that has five or six risk factors. They have a major cancer operation, which is four. They're over 75, which is three more. That's seven. They're overweight, which is eight. They have swollen legs, which is nine. And their mother died of a...
That patient is getting out of bed for the first time, and this is in hospital uh, 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 plans and indications. They'll put the Caprini score down and they'll say prophylaxis should be continued until the patient is ambulatory or goes home from the hospital and in some cases for seven days. I have not seen... what You have a patient with a risk factors of 12 and of course now they're in bed so it's 13. So take away the risk factor for being at bed rest. So you go from 13 to 12. Does that mean you can stop prophylaxis? Not on my watch. And I think that's a bad, a bad initiative. And sometimes nurses will come around and say, we've got to give you this shot, but it's painful. But if we'll just get up and walk around, it'll help prevent a blood clot. Walking around, but it's not going to overcome the myriad of factors that puts you in a very high risk group. We said this, Boro. So, family history. If anybody here has ever had surgery, tell me if the surgeon ever asked you if there's a family history of thrombosis. Not a, a blanket statement, is there any cardiovascular disease? That's what's usually in those, those forms you fill out. It's the most f frequently missed or ignored risk factor. And here's a study in 183,000 patients. And if anybody out there can tell me why this isn't included in the latest up-to-date summary of a family history of thrombosis, I'd be interested to know. Because it's 183 patients followed for over 20 years and it was published in the prestigious Thrombosis and Hemostasis Journal in 2013. And the study showed an increased VTE risk, not only among first degree relatives, but also second and third degree relatives. And the genetic component of the family clustering of VTE is strong. You know what? Clots run in your family. Just because we can't diagnose all the reasons for that, the Genome Project is going to help us. But the family history is potentially useful for clinical VTE risk assessment, even in second and third degree relatives. And here we have non-biologic uh, relatives, people that live together. And of course, they might be sedentary. They might be eating a bad diet. They might be smokers. They might uh, be heavy drinkers. They might have sleep-induced apnea uh, because of their overweight and cardiomyopathies. Uh, due to ventricular dysfunction because of being very overweight. So it's no wonder that there is a slight association, but it's not great. But it's important. This is important. This is an important study. This is an important concept. And again, the title of it is, well, blood clots just tend to run in families, like a lot of other things. Family history is a risk indicator for a first venous thrombosis, regardless of the other risk factors identified. In clinical practice, this is key. This is Archives of Internal Medicine, 2009. In clinical practice, family history may be more useful for risk assessment than thrombophilia testing. And of course, today, we can't afford to do thrombophilia testing in everybody. As a matter of fact, a lot of it is turned down by insurance companies. But you can go back and ask the history. And if the, the, the family history may reflect genetic factors and the carriers of genetic factors are at increased risk, of a first venous thrombosis, particularly when exposed to environmental triggers such as this. So, your mother had a clot, and now you're having an operation. And unbeknownst to you or your mother, she has a factor V Leiden or a prothrombin gene defect. Well, now your mother not only has had a history of a clot, but she's had a genetic e defect. And you're over the age of 75, you're uh, immobilized, uh, you're at extended bed rest, you have cancer, uh, and so you have multiple additional environmental triggers. Your chance of a blood clot is 60-fold higher than somebody without that family history. And that's very compelling. Patients with a positive family history, a third of them when tested are found to have a risk factor. And the chance of finding a genetic risk factor was up to 36% with several affected relatives. The relative risks associated with a positive family history was of similar magnitude as a genetic risk factor itself. So in conclusion, the risk assessment using the Caprini score is one road to Rome. There are many roads to Rome. But utilizing a patient-friendly form that's filled out by the patient, is verified by the doctor, avoiding chart review, done face-to-face, -face, and updated in a dynamic fashion during hospitalization and after is critical. Patient goes home okay, but we find out that they're in a wheelchair when they go home because of too, um, too much pain. Well, you've got to keep track of that. Appropriate prophylaxis for at-risk patients cannot be discontinued just because the patient becomes ambulatory.
Anticoagulant prophylaxis does not cause bleeding, but saves lives. Extended prophylaxis for at least 21 to 28 days for cancer, joint replacement, prior VTE, and or a score of greater than eight. Continue prophylaxis for as long as the risk is ongoing. Like Yogi would say, as long as the patient's at risk for thrombosis, the patient's at risk. And pay very careful attention to personnel and family history of VTE in first, second, and third generation individuals. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention.